By listening to this short ad, you are supporting our podcast. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it is the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There is creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you, so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Thank you. So, hello. Hi. (laughs) Welcome to the show and uh, it's great to meet you again. You too. (laughs) Yeah, and uh, it was really great to meet you. Uh, I believe it was like a meeting for like an for authors and artists. I, I don't remember right now <laughs> when uh, we met at El Cajon downtown. Yeah. And let me just shortly like introduce you to our audience. So, uh, author Amanda Matty, Matty has a <laughs> revived cool writing style. And you know uh, what a nice lady she is, even if you haven't met her in person. I did meet her uh, also, and she uh, with her husband, and she has um, a powerful individuality uh, uh, characteristics. And uh, it was really interesting to meet you guys. And also, uh, you are the author of two books. Yes. Um, one is titled "A Foreign Affair." A True Story of Love and War that was uh, published in 2016. Yes. Okay. And Voicing the Eagle was published in 2017, like one year after. Yes, they were. They came out a year apart. Oh. Uh, okay. My. Uh, okay. Uh, let me ask you this: uh, In your book, A Foreign Affair, A True Story. Um, you go over the transformation of your life, getting in the dangerous nature of serving in Iraq's war in 2005. And through this dangerous experience, you discovered your true love and, on a foreign soil. Can you tell us about this book and yeah, like how you ended up writing it? Um, well, here it is. That's the book. And um, I wrote it just because um, I felt I had a unique story. <laughs> um, I was 22 and I deployed to Iraq with the military as a foreign affairs liaison officer. And I was stationed in the green zone. And um, a lot of my work dealt with interacting with Iraqi government personnel and of course, I didn't speak Arabic. <laughs> uh, they didn't speak too much English at the time. Um, so I needed a translator. Uh, so uh, Fadi was assigned to me as my translator and that's how we met. And um, from there, we spent a lot of time together, you know, working uh, obviously there in Iraq and uh, we fell in love. <laughs> that's that's cool. And uh, I, f- I find, I mean, your book, the style, writing style is really interesting because you give like a vivid description of uh, what you have been through, which is very important for an author to do. Um, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so can you tell me like when you fell in love with the, your husband, Fadi, uh, did you find any differences like in culture in points of view or or he was like ready like uh, from the beginning (laughs) well of course we were very different i mean we're from opposite sides of the world so yes culturally we were very different um it felt like he was from another planet (laughs) and i'm sure i i kind of felt a little bit like that he was he's probably more, you know, in tune with American culture than I was with Iraqi culture, obviously. 
um, through movies and Hollywood, you know, thanks to Hollywood, yes. <laughs> everybody knows, or thinks they know American culture, thanks to Hollywood. Um, right. But yeah, for me, but I found it very interesting. I was just, um, he was just, he fascinated me. I thought it was, I thought he was fascinating. Um, I was very, like I said, I was very young when I went over there. I was very naive. Um, and it was amazing how I, I really grew up in that summer. I was only there for not even a full four months, but in that four months, I felt like I, I just did a lifetime of growing up and changing and learning. Um, I mean, I was in the middle of a war. I went over there, you know, completely, you know, I had just been in the military for a few years. And of course our mindset um, that, that was kind of in us and that had been kind of brainwashed into us. I hate to use that word, but it really was kind of brainwashed into us was you're to go over there and shoot first and ask questions later and kill the Hajis, you know, yeah. it was. And so I went over there, you know, with a bit of that mindset, which I'm not proud of. Um, but getting there and meeting Fadi and others I, my eyes were open and the whole world opened up to me and I learned so much and he taught me so much, even though our cultures were completely different. We had grown up in completely different places. Um, we had even been kind of, you know, mentally brainwashed to be pitted against each other. Um, it's amazing. They really is true that love can overcome, I guess, all of those obstacles and those odds. And then, of course, when we decided to have a relationship, his family and my family both were like, no, okay. <laughs> you know, so they were like, no, you'll, it'll never last. You're too different. Um, you, you came from two different backgrounds. You can't build a lasting relationship. You won't be able to, to share a life together and be happy with each other. And I'm proud to say, I guess, that we kind of defied those odds. We've been married now for uh, 13 years, 14 years. <laughs> uh, that's great. Uh, you know, I, I have, uh, like, I know when, when I read um, your book, uh, I, I find, I found it that because I am, I am from the same background, so I understand, maybe I will be uh, more able to understand your story than most Americans do. And also, uh, because my brother was uh, just like her husband working as a translator with the U.S. Army. And I find, you know, it takes a great deal of courage. Uh, and if you, I, when I um, take a look at your story, I believe it was difficult for you to make such a decision. And, but you succeeded, uh, which is great. Okay. I'm hard headed, <laughs> <laughs> which is good uh, sometimes. <laughs> so, um, uh, reading through your book, also, um, Foreign Affair uh, starts with the story of your uh, ex boyfriend, Sean, when you have been uh, writing this part. Have you encountered any feelings of jealousy or? Did your like your husband feel uncomfortable? Uh, because I know how a Middle Eastern man can be uh, <laughs> jealous. Or I mean, it's just our culture. Uh, can you tell me about that? Um, well, no. Honestly, there was no issues. I mean, Fadi knew that uh, about my that I had a boyfriend, you know, from the time that we met, even though my boyfriend and I had kind of broken up. I, of course, that's kind of a defense mechanism. I was like, yeah, yeah, I have a boyfriend, you know, yeah. um, even when I was over there. So, I mean, he, he knew about, you know, Sean. And, um, so when it came to writing the book and of course, Sean was, you know, a big part of the beginning and a big, a big part of the reason why, uh, things went South for us, you know, in Iraq, um, so no, they're really, I mean, Fadi, Fadi's pretty laid back. <laughs> he's, he's pretty, you know, um, and also too, I don't think Fadi's read the book, <laughs> but like, believe it or not, uh, he's never read. I mean, he might've, he might've read, you know, bits and pieces and parts here and there. Um, but he's never sat down and read the book from cover to cover because it's, 
you know, it's still hard. I mean, you've read it. There's some tough things in there. Yeah. And it was, I know how difficult it was for me to write. There were, there were certain points where I had to put the book down, you know, when I was writing it and just leave it for months at a time because I just, I didn't want to rehash all of the crap that we went through and the things that he went through. Um, it was, it was difficult. So, I mean, it would be difficult for him to read. Um, so I understand that someday. I told him someday before you die, you have to read my book. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, it's, it shows, that shows that your husband, Fadi, is an open-minded person. He is. is yeah, very. <laughs> yeah, which is very good. Um, okay, can, can you also tell me about, okay, what do you think about the Iraq war? Because most Americans <laughs> right now, they feel it was wrong and why we have been there but how how you deal with that at the same time that you discovered your um life partner there like yeah yeah how do you kind of like reason those two things <laughs> yes. um yeah i mean it's it's hard it it is i mean everybody of course asks us um they think you know that we have a unique um, a unique view into this or maybe a unique um, knowledge behind this. I mean, obviously when I went over there again, I was very young. So, and I was in the military, I was just, you know, I was doing what I was told. <laughs> um, and as far as body is concerned, you know, obviously he wasn't too happy about, you know, the Americans invading his country and spinning his life upside down. Um, so, it was, it was tough, but I guess we both just kind of, we just evolved and we, we kind of rolled with everything. Um, and we never lost sight of who we were as people. And I think that helped a lot. Um, as far as what we think about the Iraq war, I mean, Fadi doesn't, he doesn't blame the Americans for invading. Um, he understands why they, why we did it. Um, we both though, of course, I mean, going in and getting rid of Saddam, maybe not such a bad idea, but yeah. basically everything we did after that, <laughs> um, there were probably better paths that we could have taken. It was just kind of mistake after mistake after mistake once we toppled, you know, Saddam's regime. And I think that's, of course, and I think that's what a lot of people realize looking back. But of course, hindsight's twenty twenty. I hate to say like, oh, we, we knew better at 22 or 23 how to, you know, run a war or something like that. But I mean, hindsight's twenty twenty. Looking back, you know, just as you know a person you know just reading about it and researching um there were things along the way that we could have done differently obviously to um ensure that the country didn't turn into a, a power vacuum and a place for al-qaeda and isis to spring up yes uh, i mean you described it very well because i also had um, i mean i am from the region and i still see it as a very complicated picture so um so for a foreigner like uh, an american to describe it this way it's <laughs> really cool yeah like most americans um unfortunately don't even know where iraq is like even the location um uh, and uh, i agree with you that america the american government could have done a better job especially um if they were not like they didn't allow, for example, the militias to exist in the first place. Um, yeah. yeah, we just had the American government had a very, very elementary knowledge of Iraq and its internal politics. Yeah. Um, people in the higher echelons of the government just did not understand the people. They did not understand the the dynamics of the country. They didn't understand even how Saddam was ruling, and and um, I don't say anything that he did is justified but there were reasons behind why he did certain things um and so because we didn't have that we didn't have the knowledge and we really didn't know the dynamics of the cultures and the clash of cultures that has been going on in iraq for centuries already so ever since the british drew the borders you know um because we didn't understand that we totally botched you know the post-war rebuild up and we had this very, very um, horribly ignorant mindset of, well, Saddam was a Sunni, so all Sunnis are bad. Yes. Saddam 
was against the Shiites or the Shiites were against Saddam. So all Shiites are good. Yes. So because we had that, that mindset, that right there just laid the groundwork for the utter mess that Iraq became after Saddam left. The sectarian violence. Yeah, the, sec- the sectarian violence and um, all, of, all of that lovely stuff. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, that's true. And um, also, uh, I hope that you don't forget also, the Kurds also had a hand in that um, equation. And especially the Kurds were, uh, I mean, they were trying to separate themselves from Iraq. And yeah, the Kurds have been trying to get independence for, for decades, and, if not longer. And they were not ready for it. I mean, to be independent, you have to first build a nation, but they didn't. So, uh, okay, on the way to writing a book or and even going to Iraq, I believe that you started at least studying some foreign affairs. And I know that you have a bachelor in political science, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, can, <laughs> yeah. Can, can you tell me about your experience with political science, why you loved that major? Yeah, how you ended up loving politics? Well, I mean, it Kind of just, I mean, I joined the Navy when I was 17, actually. I went to boot camp at 17, um, and then they uh, sent me to the Defense Language Institute out in Monterey, California, and they made me a Russian linguist. They taught me Russian, um, and then I got stationed in D.C. So I was in D.C. as a Russian linguist. 9-11 happened while I was in the middle of my Russian training. So I was kicking myself for not learning Arabic. (laughs) Um, So I got sent to DC and of course being a Russian linguist at the end, you know, at the end of the cold war and after nine 11, um, there wasn't really much that they were doing with us. So I kind of just sat and twiddled my thumbs, Mm -hmm. you know, at my, at my duty station in DC. Um, And then of course, when we invaded Iraq, um, I volunteered to go over there because they were just looking for people that had security clearances. So I had a security clearance. I knew Intel, basic Intel operations. So they were like, well, we'll just send you over to um, Iraq, you know, to do a little uh, foreign affairs assignment. So of course, deploying over there as a foreign affairs liaison officer, that really got me interested more uh, in, you know, international policy and international relations. And then, of course, after I learned everything that I that I did over there in Iraq and I saw the dynamics and I was at the center of, you know, this war going on that our, our country was waging, um, I, 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 of course, got even more interested. And I actually didn't finish my, my degree until after I got back oh. from Iraq. Yeah, so I finished my degree after I got back from Iraq. Um, and, of course, I was, I was in the middle of trying to marry a man. <laughs> you know, from, from a foreign country. So that of course, even more solidified my interest in international affairs and all that stuff. So that's really how I got into that. And then of course, the political side uh, of it came from when I was trying to get him out of Iraq. I learned a lot about our nation's immigration laws (laughs) and how broken that system is. I learned a lot about, you know, just our political mindset towards, you know, foreigners and foreign nationals. Um, and it, it blew my mind. I was like, our system is archaic and these powerful people at the top of our government have no clue what they're doing. Yes. So of course, then that, you know, further <laughs> pushed me to study it more, research it more, um, kind of more devote, you know, my professional life to, and my educational career to, and all that good stuff. So that's, that's basically what drove me towards that direction. <laughs> yes. And uh, I didn't know, like, why, I mean, I thought it's okay for an American soldier or officer to marry um, a foreign national or an Iraqi translator. But then I discovered, when I discovered your story, I I knew that there were limits on that, especially uh, because you worked with the NSA. Um, yeah, can, can you tell, tell us about this? scandal how how you get in trouble 
Yeah, it was a lot more of a scandal than I thought it would be, especially, you know, even having a security clearance and even, you know, being in the military, I mean, for, I mean, American service members have been marrying foreigners since war started, since our country was born, (laughs) you know what I mean? In World War II, how many guys came home with Japanese wives? How many guys came home with German wives? You know what I mean? Um, So for me, you know, knowing the history of everything, I didn't, I didn't think it was going to be that weird of a thing um, or that big of a deal, especially, I mean, it's, it's the 21st century kind of a thing. Um, Obviously though, back then it was uh, male service members marrying female foreigners. And I didn't realize that that was going to be such a huge factor. Uh, Me being a female and marrying a male foreigner really seemed to just blow a lot of people's minds. Um, and, and they didn't think, you know, me as a woman, you, if you fall in love, you're gonna, you're gonna start spouting national secrets to him or something like that. Um, like we, like you silly girls, you know, we don't, we don't know how to contain our emotions or ourselves when we're in love. So we're just gonna, you know, wreck the entire nation. Should we fall in love with a foreigner who might have nefarious, you know, goals or, so, or, like yeah. Like misogynist. Um, yeah. Oh, definitely. It was, it was unbelievable. I mean, uh, when I came back, I said, you know, well, first of all, Fadi was in a lot of danger because he had worked for the Americans. Um, as you know, I'm sure your brother knows and everything. As soon as Al Qaeda or the resistance finds out that a local Iraqi is helping the Americans, he's branded a traitor. Um, he's literally uh, Fadi had wanted posters with his picture hanging in mosques across Fallujah. Um, he was coming home from work and finding hand grenades sitting on his doorstep with notes wrapped around them that said, stop working for the infidels or we're going to kill you and your family. So he, he, he was getting shot at when he would like drive to the base or when he would leave the base, he was literally getting shot at. So he was, his life was in imminent danger because of the service that he was giving to our nation because of the help that he was doing for us. And when he told, uh, you know, the powers that be, uh, and when I told, you know, my, you know, American bosses and the people above me, they basically shrugged and said, Oh, there's nothing we can do to help him. And I said, you know, well, that's crap. I mean, after everything he's done, he's literally bled for this country and we're going to leave him to, you know, hang out to dry. There's nothing that you're saying there's nothing we can do to get him out of the situation. And so when they said that to me, I said, well, you know what? I'll get him out. So I, at the time, there was not the, there's currently now a visa that translators can apply for, or at least there used to be. Um, But at the time that didn't exist yet. So there was no way for Fadi to get out of, out of Iraq and into the U S. So I brought him over. I decided to file for a fiance visa and bring him over on a K-1 fiancé visa, mainly just to get him out of Iraq to save his life. Um, so we filed for that. And then when the Navy learned, you know, that I was trying to bring over this Iraqi national, they flipped out. They freaked out. Oh, my God, he's a terrorist. He's using you. He's he just at, at best, he's using you for a green card. At worst, he's coming over here to do another 9-11. Yeah. Um, and it was unbelievable. So, of course, they freaked out. They locked me up, basically. <laughs> um, they, they, t- they shut off all my communication. They, they stopped everything. They put me through a disciplinary review board hearing where basically you stand up and all of your, your bosses in the military yell at you and tell you what a shitbag you are. <laughs> so I was standing up, you know, in front of this and they literally were saying things to me like out of 350 million Americans you can marry. Why do you have to marry an Iraqi? You're so pretty. And it was just unbelievable. I, I couldn't believe that this was the 21st century yeah. military saying these things and doing these things simply because I was female and I was trying to marry a foreign national that I had met in a war zone. Yeah. So when that all happened, I, I realized just even more how broken and backwards our system still was. So that's what drove me to write the book. Uh, that's when I started writing the book is when all this, you know, started. Um, and that's what drove me to where I am today. <laughs> because 
So, um, I mean, in the Middle East, I mean, it's very normal to see such a thing um, done by like dictatorial governments, tyrants. For example, Saddam forbid uh, Iraqi women to give um, their national uh, citizenship if they were married to their kids, if they were married to non-Iraqis. So, I mean, that's absolutely shocking to happen in America, one of the countries that call itself a democracy and a repu republic, and that uh, which serves its uh, citizen citizens. Um, but thanks to you, I mean, you opened uh, many eyes to this, and uh, we really need to fix uh, this broken system. And okay, uh, what do you think about what's happening right now? I mean, this um, coronavirus and how our president deals with it, especially after recently he suggested that people should um, use uh, disinfectants and uh, bleach or such a thing. Uh, how, where do you see our country going to? I mean, honestly, I don't think he needs any comment. <laughs> he speaks pretty well for himself. It's, it's you know, um, you don't really have to read between the lines with him. You he he you get what you what what you get with him, and he does he does say what he means and means what he says. Um, but I mean, unfortunately, after I went through what I was going through, I did see improvement um, under Obama, and a little later, you know, when when the ignorance started to die down a little bit, you know, for foreigners and Iraqis and people, you know, stopped thinking that all Muslims, you know, were terrorists and, and, you know, it was, it was starting to go a little bit in, in a more liberal direction as far as that's concerned. And people were starting to open their eyes and it wasn't, you know, anymore where, I mean, when Fadi first came over here, he was afraid to speak in Arabic on his cell phone, you know, when we were in a store, like we would be like shopping at Walmart and his phone would ring and he would see that it was his mom calling and he would have to speak to her in Arabic. So he would have to ignore the call so that he didn't have to pick up the phone and speak Arabic in the middle of Walmart because, because, you know, the looks and just people. Yeah. It's just, you know, when they hear some dude speaking Arabic, you know, luckily, <laughs> right. Luckily, you know, over the last, you know, few years that changed a lot. Um, and so we were seeing improvement. Even the military um, changed uh, a lot and kind of went back on things. They, they kicked me out and um, gave me a general discharge. They came back a couple of years uh, ago and were like, hey, we we're willing to upgrade your discharge, you know, to honorable. We understand, you know. Well, kind of what happened and, and um, that you kind of got the short end of the stick on this. Uh, so we, we would offer, you know, to upgrade your discharge and stuff like that. So we were seeing, you know, we were happy to see these improvements. Now, of course, it seems like we're going backwards again. Um, obviously, you know, we were trying to, the, the immigration system never got fixed. I mean, even under Obama, it was still a mess. Um people don't understand they always say you know if you want to immigrate here that's fine but you need to stand in line and do it the right way people don't understand that there really is no line yes. there is no way to immigrate here legally if you were uh, a, a guy living in guatemala and you're like i want a better life i want to immigrate to the u.s there is no way that you can do it there is no legal way to do it so there's no there's no form you can fill out. There's no line you can stand in. And I think that's what people in America don't understand. They're like they're they're being told these lies like, oh, well, they're here illegally because they didn't want to stand in line or they didn't want to do it the right way. Yeah, well, there is no right way to do it. And there hasn't been. And that's never been fixed under Obama or Bush or Trump or anybody. So obviously because of that. Um, and then, of course, the coronavirus now has just complicated everything <laughs> um yeah everything's complicated even more now um of course people are I, you say oh trump didn't do enough oh trump did more than he should have i mean again hindsight's 2020 yeah um so and i mean i'm no disease you know expert or infectious disease expert or anything like that um but yeah i think everybody knows um has seen shortcomings and things that we could have done differently. 
yeah. to maybe help out, but um, I guess it is what it is. <laughs> cool. Uh, I mean, it's cool to hear your um, point of view. I mean, I absolutely agree with you because um, since I came here, I have heard like this kind of uh, people who tell me, oh, well, if you hate America, why you don't go back? And I tell them, well, if you are, if you see something wrong in politics, that doesn't mean that you hate the country. The opposite, when you criticize some politicians, that because you love America, you should, you want to change things to be better. And, yeah, you need to change yeah. it. It's the same thing. When people say that to me, I'm like, well, if you see a guy beating his wife in the street, you just turn around and go home because you don't like it. No, you intervene and you do something to stop it and change it. <laughs> yes, that's true. And uh, believe me, um, the way to here was not easy, as you say. And there was no correct way to do it. I remember even going through blood and I have seen like a, a car exploded near the hotel where I was waiting for the embassy interview. Oh, wow. Yeah, so uh, I know how it feels and I know that uh, your husband, for example, uh, he it, it feels like a war zone there and even so he was a translator. So it it must be much more harder for him because he was on the list of the terrorists. Um, I, I believe that his family was suffering because of that too. Uh, and coming to this, can you tell me about your second book, uh, Voicing the Eagle? Um, yes. What is Voicing the Eagle and, yeah, and who is the eagle? Uh, if you can explain, please. Uh, yeah, the title is, I guess, kind of a play on words, voicing the eagle. Obviously, the eagle is the United States, and voicing the eagle, Fadi was the voice of the United States um, when he was a translator and going out on, like, he was one of the few local translators that would actually go out on missions um, with the Marines um, on patrols through Fallujah, through Ramadi. Um, he worked with a civil affairs unit um, that was going door to door trying to, you know, help the people and trying to weed out Al Qaeda at the time that was, you know, hidden amongst the residents. Um, so he, of course, did that. And um, so the book Voice in the Eagle is his story. It's actually more of even though I wrote it second, it, it takes place before our story. So it's kind of a prequel. Yes. <laughs> it's a prequel to a foreign affair. Um, because when I met Fadi, he had already been working as a translator for the US for um, two and a half years because I didn't get to Iraq until 2005. So he had been working as a translator since the war broke out, basically, in 2003. Um, so he had already um, worked with the Army. He had worked with the Marines. He had been, um, he'd been shot. He had broken his arm um, when a Humvee he was riding and flipped over after being struck by an RPG. He had literally been fighting on the front lines uh, for two years by the time I met him. Um, so he had all these little stories that he would, you know, tell me this just, just different things that happened. And again, another reason I found him fascinating when I met him was, you know, these stories that he was telling me, he was, you know, this local Iraqi kid who was living a double life. You know what I mean? He uh, would put on a, a U.S. Marine uniform during the day and he was a Marine or he would put on an army uniform during the day and he was an American soldier. And then he would take off the uniform, put on his civilian clothes again and go back home to his house in central Baghdad. So then he became an Iraqi again. He was literally straddling these two worlds for years. Um, and I found that his point of view and the stories that he had and the experiences he had were very, very unique. Um, something that very few people experience and even fewer have written about that, that is documented. So after a while, and I was hearing all these little stories here and there, I said, you know, if we take all of your experiences and all your little stories and we put them together, you have a book and you should write a book. I will write your book. <laughs> That's so that's, that's what I did. And I, and so that's why I decided to write it. And I wanted, you know, people to see, and we also, both of the books too are for our kids. We wrote them as kind of like a, 
like a family history, I guess, kind of thing. So, I mean, our kids can read about what their parents did um, and the unique experiences that we had. And that's that's mainly why we did the books. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, you are giving uh, something to your, maybe even your grand-grandkids, I mean, the future. <laughs> and um, thank you for your um, insights and your all this the information you gave us and you open our eyes to what what is happening and i believe that we still need to reform the immigration the government yeah everything and we need people like you <laughs> yeah there's a lot of reform that needs to happen still <laughs> yeah uh, just before uh, i end uh, this uh, great interview with you, uh, do you have any other projects in your mind? Any books for the future? Um, I do actually. <laughs> um, I recently completed um, my first venture into fiction. It's a novel. Um, since both of my other books, of course, are nonfiction. And the story, it's really easy to write nonfiction. I always say, everybody's like, oh, you wrote a book. And I'm like, it's really easy when it's nonfiction. The story's there. Yeah. <laughs> you just have to write it. You got all your characters. You know what's happening. You know your plot. You just write it down, you know? Um, so that was super easy. And, of course, after becoming an author and doing book tours and um, meeting other authors, I just found, you know, these other authors who could just – pull stories out of their heads and write these, you know, fictional novels. It was amazing. And I thought it was unbelievable. And I would say, no, I could never do that. I could never do that. You know, my characters are there. Everything's there. How do you come up with everything? How do you know what they're thinking? How do you know what comes next? If it, it doesn't exist, you know, it's all imaginary. So I was like, well, you know what? Me being hard headed and yeah. liking a challenge. <laughs> um, I said, well, you know what? I'm going to try it. Yeah. So I decided, you know, I took I took the plunge last year. I, I had this idea in my head and I've had I had these characters, you know, that kind of like were invading my mindset for several months. And I said, you know what, I think there's a story here. And it's not too I mean, it's not like Lord of the Rings fantasy or anything. Yeah. <laughs> so it's still, you know, rooted in kind of like it's more of a historical fiction, military fiction. And I kind of got the concept and the idea from my bodies and my story yes. because when we got together everybody was saying oh he could be a terrorist oh he could he could be this he could be this really this evil mastermind that's using you and all this stuff of course he wasn't but what if he was <laughs> okay. that's that's kind of what the the story is it's like an alternate universe had yes. body and i taken different paths had body ended up on the wrong side of things um had he had you know nefarious you know motives and stuff like that for being with me so that's what the new book is uh it's called new dawn underground um which is the name of a fictional terrorist organization like al-qaeda um so that one is currently being edited right now of course with all the coronavirus stuff we don't know when it'll be released or ready to be published but right now it's going through editing um it is done and hopefully soon it'll be released. Oh, uh, okay. Good luck with the book and uh, with your life and your family. Thank you. And thank you for giving me this honor talking to you today. Definitely. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> you too. See you later.